then all know what happens when the media is shut out. Governments get away with murder, literally. Right, a little bit of history. In 2009, you may remember in Sri Lanka, the war was coming to a horrific close. And the United Nations, the media, the NGOs were all basically shut out of the battlefield. Some choose, chose to withdraw. I think only the Red Cross remained. But Wendy will tell you more about all of that. My point is simply that we are living with the horrific consequences of, of the media not being there in Australia as well as in Sri Lanka. And of course, everything these days is connected. The whole discussion about boat people uh, is aggravated by the, what happened in 2009. But then they're not the boat people coming to Australia. They're the ones trying to escape in Sri Lanka. The, uh, the horrific uh, bombardments that the Tamils were getting during those last days. It's not all bad news, though. In Timor-Leste in 1993, the controversial gen uh, journalist John Pill just snuck into the country illegally, as I understand it, and made his uh, famous video, Death of a Nation, the Timor Conspiracy. And that act of his helped to keep the struggle alive. And within five years, we saw things start to change, even though the consequences were horrific again. The, uh, the people, of course, now live in some kind of freedom. So it's not all bad news. I'll come back to John Pilger later. What I'm going to concentrate on now is how do the best journalists let the world in to places and stories that where they're trying to be shut out. Okay, so letting the world in. Well, one of the things they do is they get up close. You know, they're, they're not trying to get the story from back here in Australia or from the bar in, uh, as they used to say, in Saigon. Uh, they're actually out there. Can anyone tell me who that is? Uh, perhaps from Wendy? Anyone know who it is? Very famous Australian. Someone we should be really proud of. Well, if you don't know his name's Neil Davis. He was what was called a cameraman in those days. We call him a photojournalist now. He did all the things. He carried his camera out there. But what Neil did was that he used to find different points on the ground from which to view what was going on. And he used to find local voices that weren't just the usual suspects that we see all the time. I mean, I can't watch Q&A anymore or the drum on television because it's all the same people saying, parroting all the same stuff. Um, I don't know about you, but Neil, amongst other things, chose to go off with the South Vietnamese Army units and see what was happening there. And the Americans used to badmouth the South Vietnamese all the time, saying, oh, the problem with the war is the South Vietnamese Army, they won't fight. We're fighting, but they won't. He denied that. And he denied it by going out there and seeing how hard they fought for their, their cause. He also went to Cambodia into the hidden war and spent years there. But still had enough now to be the, the journalist. You've, seen, you've probably all seen his film of the North Vietnamese tank bursting through the gates of the presidential palace in Saigon. He was inside. I think he was the only one of the Western journalists who were still around. Okay, what else do the good journalists do? One of the things they do is they try to avoid groupthink. They don't just follow the conventional memes that are around. Graham Greene's press corps view from the bar. Uh, press corps view from the bar. Uh, we have its equivalent in Australia, which is you know, the press gallery in Canberra. They also chase the stories. And there, was, there are stories everywhere. Even in China, with the advent of Weibo, the, we have more open discussion and criticism. And even the Chinese government can't stop it. They have to stop their whole economy to do it. They, don't, they can just persecute a, a few people, right, to make everyone else weary. Another thing they use are the new media tools. How many people in here have ever heard of TOR? T -O -R? Stands for the onion ring. It's actually not peeling it off, but <laughs> hiding in the, inside the onion. So there are layers to protect your identity. And uh, it's 
one way that people in places like Iran can communicate over the web without the, uh, the local people, uh, the spy agencies and whatever, finding out about it. It's a bit like torrent, you know, where people get videos and stuff, and music, pirated stuff. It's the same kind of technology. So uh, the State Department of the United States don't like Tor because it might interfere with their uh, proprietorial rights for their Hollywood, etc. But uh, you can go on and find out about Tor if you wish. Okay, another thing, that, and that's uh, just from Tor's website. Another thing they do is find the key players and alternative voices that are on the net, on Twitter and other social media sites. They follow people with different languages, cultures and beliefs. There is this thing, especially in Australia, but also in the, in, in the West, uh, where if it's not in English, it doesn't exist, or it's not important. And the mass media miss really important stories all the time because they're not in English. Uh, and you don't know, I only, I'm really only an English language person, and I can find the stories and, and get them translated or, or whatever, right? So the, uh, the media should be able to as well. The next thing they do is they make friends. Okay? And some of those friends are in NGOs like Reporters Without Borders, Human Rights Watch, Witness, Amnesty Oxfam, and even Global Voices. They're some of my friends. That was in Nairobi at our summit earlier this year. You can see, uh, hey, where's Wally and try and find me because I can't do it. There were so many people there and they're from all around the world. Global Voices, in fact, is an international community of bloggers, for want of a better word, but we're authors and translators who try to give a voice to people, the ordinary people who are online. So if there's something happening like, um, for example, the destroy the joint stuff. I wrote a post for Global Voices on what people were saying on their blogs and on the Twitter sphere about that particular thing happening in Australia. And it has an international audience and it gets translated into other languages by our volunteers. So it could be in Swahili, it could be in French, it could be in one of the, a couple of dozen languages. Okay. Since this is a law conference, a couple of legal dilemmas. And some of these have already been touched on by some of our speakers. Is it ever justifiable to break the law to expose human rights abuses or defend those rights? To save lives, to bring mass murderers and torturers to justice? Is it justifiable to publish illegally obtained documents? Or multimedia? To use hidden cameras, bugging, entrapment, phone tapping? taping or hacking, or to enter countries illegally like John Pilger, or to trespass. Is it okay to do those things if we're trying to save lives, catch the murderers? One organisation that's had a lot of flack in, and the, when you may talk about that, I'm not sure about Google and Yahoo and the like and their role as international citizens, but they were criticised when they removed innocence of Muslims from YouTube without government requests. Google cited uh, increasing forced compliance by governments, and they have to obey the law, don't they? The, the local law of the countries. Um, as a business, uh, not a not-for-profit, what should their human rights responsibilities be? Should they, in fact, be any different from the people like Rupert Murdoch in China? or any other business that happens to be in China. There's a, a debate around all that which does raise both legal and ethical dilemmas. Now, one of the areas that is particularly difficult in crisis situations is ethical reporting. There are plenty of guidelines about how to do it. You probably know lots of them already. But how do journalists protect the rights of victims? and others are involved. Right. For example, how many of these children coming out of a bomb shelter in Sri Lanka in 2009 were asked their permission to put this online? Last week in Global Voices, there was a huge debate about whether we should publish 
a photograph that had a child in it at a demonstration in Russia. Were we breaching the uh, human rights of that child by putting that photo on the web? I don't think we resolved the question yet, but at least we're discussing it. I suspect a lot of the media never have those discussions. On the question of media ethics, well, a little an anecdote that I particularly like that I discovered when I was preparing is about a Turkish journalist who masqueraded as a human shield in Baghdad in 2003. So he got to go around to all sorts of places in Baghdad and, and the surrounds without being completely controlled, like all the other journalists who were in the, uh, the hotels in the centre of Baghdad who had sort of three guards with them all the time. And so he broke some of the best stories by what you could call unethical behaviour. Okay. Mark uh, Colvin at when his Andrew Rowley lecture recently talked about a crisis of credibility. Did anybody see that or hear it or read it? You really should. It's online. Go to the ABC or just Google it and you'll find it. Watch the video or read the transcript. It's a very important uh, lecture. Now, that, that crisis of credibility has a lot to do with what the, the media are actually covering. The mainstream media have the responsibility to cover not just the sensational stories or the ones that are easier to access. They need to be trying to find the full truth of what's out there. They need to follow up and follow through rather than just moving on to the next tragedy. For example, whatever happened to the Arab Spring? I can tell you it's not over. A lot of people think it is. When did you last see stories about Kuwait, Bahrain or Morocco, for example? What about Mauritania? That's the constitution in that coffin. There have been very large violent, well, pro violent protests because they pro the, the authorities have put them down in Mauritania throughout this year and it never gets any mention. I bet most people in the world, perhaps even in this room, couldn't find Mauritania on a, a world map if I, if I gave you five minutes. I might be being a bit rough on you. Um, what about Jordan? You know, that, that, that country that's just between Gaza and, uh, and, uh, and Syria, not very important. There have been huge protests there in the last fortnight. That's one of them. This one in the capital of Man, I'm assured there was no tear gas used. It was a relatively peaceful protest, but it kind of been very far off becoming something like we saw in Yemen or Tunisia or, or the like. Now, a question for you all. Which country do you think the hashtag tear gas is used on a regular basis because there is so much tear gas around? And I mean on an almost daily basis sometimes. Anyone want to guess? Show you a couple of photos. School children turning around, perhaps trying to get away from them. It's, it's Bahrain. We never hear much about Bahrain. It could be because I think it's the American, is it the fifth fleet or the seventh fleet or whatever it lives there? So it's, it's a bit hands off. It was invaded by the United Arab Emirates. You know, where our Qantas are going to take us all next year or whenever. You know, and, and by the Saudis. Wonderful democracies. Now, under that, another crisis is in objectivity. Global Mail's Jess Hill, who's I think in Lebanon, a journalist in Lebanon, wrote recently how prominent commentators from the anti imperialist left have twisted the public door discourse on Syria and provided intellectual cover for the Assad regime. She was mainly talking about in the UK and the States, but she also attacked our old mate from earlier, John Pilcher. You can uh, have a look at her uh, article on the Global Mail if you want to. Uh, I'm sure she, she mightn't be always objective either. I don't know. But it's an interesting question, just how objective we should be and how objective is the information we're getting all the time. Now finally, on, on this question of credibility, 
Journos need to keep their bullshit detectors very finely tuned these days. Okay. How can a journalist distinguish the real stuff from the spin, the PR and the propaganda? Who are the genu genuine voices on Twitter or the blogosphere? How do you identify the sock puppets, the trolls and the false identities? It could be a Labor staffer or a Mossad agent, for all we know. That's Labor with or without a U. Verification and authentication are vitally important, as vitally important as ever. But there are ways of doing it. You, know, you, can, you can learn how to look at metadata on a video or on a, on a uh, photograph and find out some of its background. It's not difficult. Okay, some dangers and dilemmas. Some of these have been touched on earlier today too. One of the unintended one of the risks is the unintended consequences of covering protest action. Well, we should try to do no harm, as Google says. Well, in Tunisia, apparently more than 100 people set themselves alight in the year after the revolution began with that fruit seller. That fruit seller who you will have all seen in the media at some time or another. That's in the hospital. In Tibet, We've seen the images of self-harm. Well, we're quite familiar with the problems of self-harm in this country. Okay, now the recent coverage of the, those raises the issue of whether media reporting may be encouraging these suicides. That's what the, the only comparison I can kind of make is the Hawthorne effect. Anyone ever heard of the Hawthorne effect? Right, skip that in your research at uni. That's when researchers, when researchers are looking at a problem if people know they're being researched, their behaviour changes as a result, and so you can't get flawed research. Well, in journalism, if people know they'll get reported or that the media are present, they change their behaviour. Sometimes self-harming themselves or harming other people or whatever. Sometimes they refrain from shooting someone or whatever because they don't want to be on camera. It's not all bad. But the, the media is not a completely passive player in, in all of this. That's uh, one of those Tibetan self-immolators. Last night I got a draft post on Global Voices because I do a bit of sub-editing asking if I could help. There's, uh, there's going to be a post that will probably have the next 24 hours. It's 19 of the, the monks who have set themselves alight left what we call wills. They're suicide notes and somebody has translated them. Now that is useful in the human rights arena, but it's also dangerous if people decide to copycat or whatever, or to use the media. Okay, protecting sources, protecting victims, protecting co-workers, protecting yourself are increasingly difficult tasks for the media. Bill Latch, Neil <laughs> Davis' sound recordist, died alongside him on the, the Bangkok Street in 1985 when Neil was killed, covering a coup. It's a dangerous business and other people can suffer when you're trying to get the story. Today, journalists are threatened species in many parts of the world. 150 Filipino journalists have been murdered since 1996. There's a video on my website you can have a look at. Currently in Turkey, there are 61 journalists who are in prison because of their media work. Now, money. Money makes the world go round, but it and journalists are getting very thin on the ground. The ABC has one reporter in North Africa and the Middle East, and one for the whole of the rest of Africa. Now, Matt Brown and Ginny Stein do an amazing job being everywhere. It's only if there's a war breaks out between the, in, uh, Israel and Palestine that they might send an extra person over there so we get a balanced view from uh, uh, Gaza and Tel Aviv, as we've had the last week. At the same time, investigative journalism is very expensive and doesn't suit the 24-7 news cycle. So we're getting less of that, less of that, especially in the human rights area. Now, are there any solutions to some of these problems? Now, one of the areas that's made a bit of a comeback are press agencies. You know, AAP, AP, AFP. It's the French mob. I think they took that original photograph that I showed you of the, the children coming out of the bomb shelter. Okay. They're actually hiring journalists. 
But do we really want to rely on this kind of generic reporting of human rights issues? Because that's what it is. It sort of gets at arm's length rather than our own media being out there and following through, like I mentioned before. Another one possible solution is the new media. Okay, the old media increasingly looking to them for help. Crowdsourcing is just one example. There's also a growing number of online, so online sites such as the Global Post, which I highly recommend, plus niche operations like Internews and Global Mail, the Australian one I referred to before. Okay, now finally just a word about responsibilities. It's not enough to blame the audience as many media leaders have done recently. We all must take responsibility for making sure that human rights coverage flourishes. Yes, it's everyone's responsibility to make sure that we move beyond the sensational. Tell stories that might not have incredibly violent imagery, but are out there and need to be addressed. Even tell the stories about being locked out. Now, incidentally, tomorrow is the International Day to End Impunity. So if you feel fired up by all this, you might go online and find out what you can do to spread the word. Because if we can't stop genocide, torture and the like, let's capture, well, let's catch some of the perpetrators, the criminals. And let's also make sure that governments don't turn a blind eye to what is going on in their own and other countries. Okay, thank you very much. You will take questions later from both speakers. They, they prefer to respond together. But uh, Kevin, I must say, we must have been born in the same year. I remember also Kennedy's assassination. And uh, it was, yeah, 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 it's interesting. Uh, but your talk about truthfulness, uh, ethical reporting, objectivity, they are the kind of things which are really uh, basic for any decent democratic society and you just can't leave it without it. I was born in Poland when uh, there was a communist Poland and there were no free media whatsoever over there. So journalists were paid for writing lies. What was also interesting, when we were purchasing newspapers, so first page which we, read, which we read, it was the last page which contained funeral notices because it was the only true page in the newspaper. Uh, just, just to tell you an anecdote from Moscow radio, there was a radio announcer and said that bicycles are being given free at the Red Square. So big enthusiasm and somebody started to in the investigate and said yes, yes, bicycles, but not in Moscow, but in Leningrad, yes, yes, bicycles, not really, but one bicycle and they are not being given away, only it was stolen. So it's how close the journalism was with life during the time of my youth. Now, one thing which possibly I would like to ask you later we are putting this very high moral standards for journalists who are working in newspapers, TV and so on. Now when we deal with online media, with social media, how does it apply? Do we transfer similar values or in a way as the online media is more free for all so you can express any opinion and the issue of accuracy is not that important. But we'll come to it later, now allow me to introduce Professor Wendy Bacon, who is Professor uh, at Australian Centre for Independent Journalism at UTS. Wendy is one possibly of best known Australian investigative journalists. She is also a lawyer, she regularly publishes in the Sydney Morning Herald, in Crikey, in the reportage online, she also, before joining UTS, worked at Channel 7 on Sunday program and 60 Minutes at John Fairfax and Sons, The National Times, Sun Herald and also SBS Deadline. She won weekly awards for future writing. Please welcome Professor Wendy Bacon. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to um, speak here today.
Um, I've found the presentations extremely interesting and informative myself. And uh, I think it, it's, I really appreciate the things that Kevin said, and I think the movement that he's speaking on behalf of Global Voices, the organisation, uh, very much it points the way, um, but also dovetails very well with what I want to say. Um, just in response to the, um, the last comment, the last question about social media and journalism, I might just start at the outset by saying um, not everyone is a journalist and uh, people are free to express their opinions. But if you are a journalist, you have an absolute obligation, an ethical obligation, to attempt to tell the truth as accurately and as fully as you can at all times. Uh, there is absolutely no excuse for going on to Twitter and publishing inaccurate things. That puts a sort of discipline onto journalism that obviously doesn't apply uh, to other people. I'm not saying that is always what happens in practice, but you know, as a journalism, it's very clear that's what the um, obligation is. Uh, look, I, there's two parts to what I want to talk about. The first part is more of a case study about Sri Lanka, but it actually comes in very well to the second case study, which is, uh, raises some issues about the reporting um, of Nauru. Uh, now, just to start with Sri Lanka, and that's when I will use the um, PowerPoint. Uh, it's interesting that Stephen said this morning he knew um, Tamil people. Um, if I go back to uh, when my son was at high school, um, now four or five years ago, um, yes, the Tamil cause had always been something that I had been aware of. I knew that there was discrimination against Tamil people in Sri Lanka. I knew that there was an ongoing civil war there. I knew that there was a truce. Um, and that um, there was a sort of area of, of Sri Lanka that was, um, if you like, administratively managed um, by the Tamil Tigers. That didn't mean that there'd never been any violence, but there was an ongoing um, sort of state within a state there, I guess you could say. Uh, my son became best friends with a young um, Tamil who was part of quite a big family who were um, very involved, as most uh, Tamil people in, in Australia were with what was happening in Sri Lanka. Um, from that, I knew that he'd been there and worked um, after the tsunami in orphanages. His father had built uh, swimming pools and other things there. He was an engineer. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, um, that I didn't know a huge amount about it, but there was at least a a reasonable explanation for the situation of the Tamil people in Sri Lanka. That's not to say that the Tamil Tigers um, did not have a military that committed um, uh, violence, of course, and uh, including human rights abuses. Now, if we jump forward to 2009, um, I was also aware by that stage, of course, as a journalist, that as a person who was interested in human rights, that the Sri Lankan government was one of those governments in the world that had the least credibility for its record in relation to freedom of expression and relation to journalism, that they regularly lie about what was happening in Sri Lanka and that journalists were murdered at a really, um, and disappeared and persecuted at a frightening rate. It rated very highly on those scores you see in freedom of expression. So um, it was there, from there that we went into um, the phase of the final stages of that civil war. I don't think it was an expectation of the Tamil community in Australia when it began that that would be, uh, that would lead to anything like, they certainly did not imagine anything like the catastrophe that actually unraveled. So let's jump forward to the Australian media. Now, um, I was aware while the conflict was going on that the reporting seemed to be particularly sparse, but it is very easy to generalise about the media and say, oh, the media's all awful, or the media's, you know, this or it's that. Um, and so I decided, as I sometimes do, to do a bit of a content analysis. It's only a small one of how the Australian media, that is how the journalists reported that conflict for Australia. Now, a key issue, and it relates very much to the topic that I'm addressing today, is that no journalists were really allowed into the conflict um, from Australia once it really got underway. Uh, there was some reporting very much embedded with the Sri Lankan government, but at a certain point, just like in the war on Gaza, not the recent events, but the earlier um, war on Gaza, the journalists were shut out. 
Now, I would argue that had very bad consequences. It certainly prevented, uh, to a large extent, anything like what Kevin was talking about, about being up close, so you can actually observe. I mean, that is the best way to do, do journalism, is actually to observe what was happening. So, uh, okay. now with these charts, they're not hugely important, and I'll just explain them fairly quickly. But you know, the essence of journalism really is what sources you select and how you position them. Uh, that, when I say sources, it's the people you quote, who you actually give voice to. And that is part of the really important role of journalism is to allow other people to have a voice. And if you don't choose certain sources, they often won't get a voice. Now what this uh, study showed, we looked at the um, Sydney Morning Herald of the Australian from uh, January to May in 2009 at the height of the crisis. As a journalist, I would have expected a fair amount of scepticism of the Sri Lankan government and what it was saying about the conflict. Now, the what this shows is the blue, the big chunk of blue is the Sri Lankan government sources. Uh, that is, we looked at the Australian and the Sydney Morning Herald. Now, if we looked um, beyond that, and I have looked at the ABC, we would not have found anything different. We would have just found less reporting and more extreme um, tendencies in this direction. This 64% of all the sources, of the first sources, that is the first source in the article in the Australian, were by the Sri Lankan government. The next biggest one, and I'll come back to that, was the United Nations, but only with 8% as opposed to 64% for the Sri Lankan government. And this is the Sydney Morning Herald, which was very similar, 55% of the first sources, which are the sources which define really usually the article, and 12%. Now, this source over here is the Tamil Tigers, the LTTE, a very tiny voice and a little bit for what was called the Tamil Net. You may not have heard of that. That was the Tamil, t t the Tamil Causes Media Outlet. It was, of course, a biased source, as is the Sri Lankan government. However, it did publish a certain amount of credible information over the years. But even though they kept operating until the very last hour, and when, as I've spoken to someone who spoke to them about an hour before they were killed, uh, they did keep uh, releasing information from Sri Lanka. Now, this just simply shows the... Um, the first, second and third sources. So then we went through the articles picking out the third and you will see for the Australian um, that the Sri Lankan government is overwhelmingly um, dominant. And that was the same for the Sydney Morning Herald. Now I'm not going to, we, we looked at different measures, I don't think I've got time to go through all that, but my main point is that the reporting, now this is what you would call passive reporting. It's not critical reporting, it's just really putting out there what a source that lacked credibility said, and it completely framed the coverage. Now, we could look at the political reasons for that, and I think it's important to do that. Now, I'll just give you one other example. Um, during the war, um, the United Nations actually did withdraw. Just this week, a big report has come out which um, criticises that decision and the whole uh, reporting, the, in, the role the United Nations played in the catastrophe that led to the loss, I'm not saying they were responsible for it, um, the loss of uh, many, many thousands of lives, up to 40 or more thousands of lives. There was a leaked UN satellite image showing the shelling um, of the um, where uh, many, many civilians were gathered and this uh, was released. Now this became um, a headline story in the UK, where the reporting was definitely more critical and more sympathetic, perhaps because of the power of the Tamil community in London, it was, uh, it was better. You'll see here, I've just got up here the headlines, the UK Times, the Telegraph. That was a headline article there. Now, I have searched through the Australian media to see what was covered of this story. It was in the Australian. Uh, the reason being that they're drawing their, their international news from London, and so we did get a moment when that was published. I cannot find it in the Sydney Morning Herald. I cannot find it on the ABC. I'm going to ask them an official question because the ABC's reporting appears to have been so poor. Just SBS. Now, I happen to know a Tamil journalist who was working there during that time, doing everything that uh, she could to make sure there was some sort of coverage. Now, that 
raises a really um, big issue. Now, just now, so that is what I want to say is that journalism takes different modes, if you like. That is one very dominant way of doing journalism in our country. Then, and really as far as I know, there was no serious attempt by journalists to get into Sri Lanka. Now, of course, I'm not here to argue they should have done that. It would have been very dangerous. However, I do want to recognise the reporting of a journalist called uh, John Snow for Channel 4, who um, the Channel 4 did go in there, they got a, a cameraman in there, and they filmed, some of you may have seen the absolutely tragic and appalling scenes of people um, being executed, of people being killed, absolutely un unspeakable um, events were happening. And that did come out at the time um, in, uh, through Channel 4. So there were journalists who were trying to get in there. Uh, now, ultimately, uh, Channel 4, and if you go onto Channel 4's site, you'll find a really excellent grouping together of all of these reports, uh, The Killing Fields by John Snow, and they continue to add to that. Now, you know, that just wasn't happening for us here in Australia. Now, of course, if you're, um, if, if you're constantly looking for your overseas sources of news, it's all very accessible to us as audiences, but it's not actually... Uh, really dominant or accessible to most Australian audiences if we can take the research into patterns of audience use in any way seriously. Uh, now what is the situation now in Sri Lanka? It is certainly not a safe situation for anyone who is critical of the Sri Lankan government. It is false to say that everything is fine in Sri Lanka as the Sri Lankan government keeps saying. They speak very violently of what they would like to do to journalists, Sri Lankan government um, politicians who are critical and try to raise their voices. There are certain areas of Sri Lanka now where um, a lot of um, outsiders have been brought in, settled in areas which are making it extremely hard for Tamil communities uh, to actually make a living. Now, I'm not going to go on, some of you may know more about Sri Lanka than I do, but it's absolutely clear that it's not a safe country. Uh, recently, there was just shown um, just in the city and one journalist, Kerry Brewster, on Late Line did a story about a film called Silent Voices. And this is about the journalists who actually had to leave Sri Lanka because they tried to tell the truth, including both Sinhalese and Tamil, um, Tamil journalists, and they've now got an organisation in exile. That's really worth following up. Now we jump forward to now, and what we find this week is that the UN which unfortunately um, talked in a sense with four tons, really muted their voices. They now say in this report that they were tuning it to the political governments that they were talking to and they failed to really report what was happening there uh, to the world and eventually left. That's a report that's actually been leaked and that's interesting um, in terms of media as well. This week perhaps it's argued by some because it would have otherwise been partly censored. So now, finally, I saw that this has been reported, it hasn't been reported widely in Australia, but yes, it's there on the ABC this week. But if we go back to the ABC's reporting, it was not their best moment during the Sri Lanka war. And this is one, my, one of my main points that I want to make here is that, um, that you sort of get the, a narrative building up and very uncritical reporting and feeding into discourses that both stigmatise people and lead to sort of people picking up on, yes, it's fine to be tough to on asylum seekers. Yes, Tamils don't have a just cause if they seek, um, seek asylum. And then after kind of the policies established, and this will bring me through to Nauru, then the journalists go into questioning mode, at least partially questioning mode. But it's like that, you know, we're moving in and out of different um, styles of journalism. My argument should, would be is that the journalism that sets up these discourses plays a very, very destructive role in terms of human rights abuses and is, in fact, complicit. That brings me to Nauru. Now, once Nauru started coming onto the agenda, and uh, you probably all observed it too, um, you know, I was waiting. I mean, I was actually waiting for the journalists to say to the government and to start sort of putting it out there, look at what happened at Nauru, in Nauru last time. 
every human rights organisation came out and, and made critical statements. And a lot of that was actually about the effects of indefinite detention, detention on human beings. It's no, it's no surprise anything that's happening on Nauru. But those voices were silent. And even some of the best journalists in Australia, uh, for example, Lee Sadows, you know, I've got an interview that she did with Christine Milne and anybody who dared raise their voices, including the Refugee Action Coalition, the Greens were all in favour of allowing people to uh, go, you know, to drown uh, on their way to Australia. And you know, there's a little bit where Lee Sales, you can go and look at an interview with Christine Milne, and she says, you know, so what, you're just going to let people drown? And Christine Milne is trying to make her point. And I think, you know, that is, that is very dangerous. Uh, now, so we, we actually had the expert panel, and I very much appreciated what um, Professor Mally said um, this morning. Um, I, feel, I felt again, that just as a journalist, when I was watching the expert panel come out for the press conference, that's a stage thing, and it is very hard as a journalist to break into the pack and to ask the critical question. I've been in that position myself, and journalists can get quite testy with each other, but nevertheless, the whole discourse of the thing, this is an expert panel, it was a package, it is, um, there's another word that has got out of my head now they're using this morning, it, it's sort of like a holistic thing they're saying, but all of these words need to be probed, and right from the very beginning they should have tried to pin them down and say, well exactly what's the timeline of bringing in the refugees from Indonesia? because the whole package sort of rested on that. But those questions weren't asked. So then we go and Nauru is actually set up and now of course the journalists can't get in there. Now the journalists are the ABC and Fairfax and New Zealand have actually sent journalists onto Nauru. Um, and one of my ex-students tweeted last night just how far away she could get from this detention centre. Jeanette Francis from SBS, and you could sort of see a large amount of jungle between her and the tents. But that was her attempt to, to say something via social media. Um, I was at a seminar last night when uh, Sandy Logan from the Department of Immigration was asked about this. And he began by putting the emphasis on that our root government's not a priority for them at the moment, it's all up to them as to whether the journalists can get in there. But under more questioning, you sort of said, well, actually, it's a partnership between the Australian government and the Nauru government, and you know, it's not a priority. Now, there are many other factors that, um, that are influencing whether journalists can go in there or not. Um, there is an agreement uh, that the, um, you have to sign if you're a journalist to go into any detention centre in Australia that actually allows for a very high degree of prior, uh, prior censorship. So you actually have to give your footage or your recording uh, for that to be vetted um, before you leave. But you're not allowed to have any substantial conversation. So how do you have an interview if you can't have a substantial conversation? The Australian Press Council has been trying to get the government to deal with this issue now for months. And uh, Julian Disney last night said at this seminar that they cannot get a response at the moment from the government. Again, the excuse from the government is that they're too busy. Now, um, that brings um, me back, in a sense, back to where um, Kevin began and um, to say that um, in those circumstances, I would have to congratulate the Refugee Action Coalition on the role they play in enabling the people locked up in Nauru to get their story out. In, in, by the way, in talking about interviewing refugees, I absolutely do believe, or asylum seekers, I actually do believe there needs to be informed consent, third parties who facilitate that, but it should be an easy process, not a difficult one. But they have enabled um, and encouraged a Facebook page, um, they have been in constant contact, they've put out press releases, and only through that do we have really any idea of what's actually going on in Nauru until Amnesty went in there this week. The Salvation Army have required their people who went over there without even job descriptions onto Nauru uh, to sign something saying they will not speak to the media now or in the future. So they're also complicit in this silence. But you know, via the social media, via the alternative media, it is no longer possible um, to actually completely silence, as I think in a way, you know, maybe 10 years ago it wouldn't be possible. 
Also, that, um, one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is just a tiny, tiny thing, but I'm contributing editor to an online uh, publication called New Matilda. And with that, I did a complete timeline of all the, not complete, but a timeline in two parts of all the events that happened on Nauru. That was it fed into a lot of journalists and I did go to speak to groups of citizens and that sort of thing about that. So it's much more within our power to actually um, to try to break through the silence which is our obligation as journalists. So I've just got a few summing up points here. Um, have I got time? Yes, yes. I'm right on time? Yes. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, journalism, as I said, is a contested space. Um, it's um, certainly not neutral. Uh, sorry, I've got a spelling mistake here for ciphers. Um, journalists are players, uh, not innocent ciphers. Constantly in political journalism, the journalists are playing often a very heavy game, um, as they have done with Julia Gillard, as they have done with Gunman, as they do, you know, there's no doubt the press gallery is constantly playing it as part of politics. That it's sort of still as if they're innocent somehow in the process, I think we have to take note of that. Um, the choice and critical approach to all sources is important. By mentioning Tamilnet, I don't want to suggest, or the press releases of the people in Nauru, that one would take an uncritical approach to that. You need to take a critical approach at all times. What my point was, that there was no need to ignore the Tamilnet if you were going to believe the Sri Lankan government. I would give them at least as much weight and in my experience, I probably have to say I would have given the Tamil Nets uh, more, more points for accuracy. Uh, I think that this whole notion of journalistic balance, and this is cut up very much in the current of climate change, this idea of you know, right, um, balance, being neutral, that whole idea, in fact, hides the truth. Uh, it hides it, I think, in the reporting on the Middle East. It hides it, uh, in, the re hit it in the reporting of um, Sri Lanka. Because sometimes you might have a little um, <coughs> third source down the bottom of the story with some sort of right of reply that is not, in fact, a right of reply at all. I think truth versus seeking balance should be the guiding principle for journalism. And I think there is a growing awareness of that amongst journalists. Sadly, the context in which journalism is practiced often makes that hard. When I think journalists are shut out, and when they are constrained, that should always be included in reports. We found that only four or five times, maybe in all, was that done with Sri Lanka. It just should be at the end of every story. We are not allowed to go there. And the government should not be allowed to get away with that. It should be constantly emphasised. Context is really important. You see this in the reporting of the Middle East, I won't go into that, but you also can see it in the reporting of, of refugees. If we take Nauru, how can you possibly report on a policy that is about to happen when you had a similar policy for you know, several years with consequences and you just don't speak about it? It's actually um, very poor journalism. Now, when, of course, journalists try to tell the truth, such as Jon Snow, Channel 4, um, some of the people, uh, John Pilger, certainly, I would not say John Pilger, it's not it's beyond criticism, not at all, but he has certainly copped a lot of abuse. But um, Jon Snow, uh, you can go onto the net and you can find a huge amount of criticism of the Channel 4 reporting on Sri Lanka. But when you start to read it, whereas I did this morning, thinking, you know, I'm just going to have another look at this, what I found is that the beat that looked like a very credible critique, but actually was reporting all the false sources from before in opposition to what they were saying, which was actually revealing what was behind those sources. So, you know, it, it's pretty, um, I think it is really uh, tricky being a journalist and trying to survive. You know, I've taught now a lot of journalists um, and, uh, you know, I, I certainly have got sympathy for the context in which they have to try to do their job and that's why I'm now glad to be free of that and able, you know, like I'm very, very lucky to have the a privilege of actually trying to make some small contribution. But we do, should not underestimate, and I'll finish here, we shouldn't underestimate the power of what we're up against. This morning I heard Frank Kelly on the breakfast show um, interviewing Minister Bowen, you know, I had criticism of her interview, but at least she was there asking some tough questions. And then I just turned on Ray Hagley, um, just on my way here, 
And Ray had views on 2GBs going out, all around the country, towns of New South Wales, sort of, you know, Sydney, fairly big audience. And he was talking about the illegals, he was talking about bullfeds, you know, doing this. Amnesty was the most appalling organisation, he'd be coming back to them to give them a bigger serve later in the morning. And this is demonisation. And it feeds into, I don't know, anyone here saw a small video uh, on a Frankston bus uh, this week where some people turned on a young French woman who was singing, she was singing in a different language. The people are angry, they're ignorant, but they're angry, and that anger is being fed by all these tough discourses. I think everyone from Chris, Chris Bowen um, to the media, and most particularly, of course, to people like Ray Hadley. Thank you. Um, my, maybe this is a comment, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, but you talked about um, um, in, in Sri Lankan context that relying on the Sri Lankan government as a primary source, even though it's not a very credible source. And um, I just wanted to seek your views, Wendy, on I mean, the fact that at least there is reporting of that issue in the media, and even if it's um, relying on non-credible sources, the issue remains alive in the context of Australian um, awareness, I guess. Well, I think the problem with that is that, um, yeah, I mean, the problem with that, yes, it is, you know, it, it is in the public arena, but it actually was false lies, you know, and the job of the media is not to put lies out there, the job of the media is to critique those lies, and there were the sources available. So I don't actually find it at all comforting to think that we're just reporting you know, whatever the next source says, because that's not the job of a journalist. I mean, if we go to the Hanif example, you know, I think, fa you know, fairly quickly there, the media did pick up and did actually play a really good role in critiquing, and that was, in a sense, a good moment for the media. I don't know whether, Stephen, you'd agree with that, but passive just putting out their propaganda, I mean, that's, that has got a very ugly and long history. I'd agree with uh, Wendy. We don't want the media to be just public relations, which is becoming more and more all the time. And uh, to be told lies. I've just been reading uh, Megan Stack's book, uh, what is it, Everyone in, the, in This Village is a Liar. In a way, unfortunately, that's the way you have to go to the media now, including online, and assume that everybody in that village is a liar until you can check it out and apply the bullshit detector to the stuff that's been fed to you. You know, sometimes it is possible to check things, and as I said, you know, it's important to be critical. I saw coming through in that press release from Nauru, from the um, Refugee Action Coalition, saying that it was 48 degrees in the tents in Nauru, you know. And I thought, oh, I'd better check that, you know, before I tweeted out or anything. And I went online and I looked at what the weather was there, and in fact, it was far less than that. So I actually, you know, went back to them and said, look, looks like it's not that hot. But then, with more investigation, I found out that in fact they were telling the truth. That in fact, I spoke to someone else who'd actually been in there with a thermometer, observed it, and, uh, you know, by, if, if you start getting on to people, you can actually find out things. And so then I was able to tweet it. Uh, sorry, I work for the United Nations, and I guess one of the challenges we have in dealing with the media, and I, I, I'm not being critical of the media, but is that consistently when we, I, I guess, try to, to talk, um, we get UN slammed government, and that's kind of the only thing that... that um, the UN slams government is kind of like sort of almost the only head, headline that is conceivable after an interview um, with a lot of journalists and I think it's very challenging. I think it's also very challenging to know whether, you know, it's helpful to have your, you know, media training and prepare your three points that you're going to stick to irrespective of what the question is or whether to try and have an honest relationship with, with good journalists and actually, you know, speak truthfully and give full background and try to explain positions. So, I wouldn't mind your comment on, on that, Wendy, but also just um, just one question, which is, um, I was around for the first time, the Pacific Solution, and um, it was true that media were not allowed on Nauru, and um, there are incredible challenges. I should just say that this time around, I think it might be a little bit different. I mean, Amnesty International is there, 
um, you know, a number of Australian Red Cross was there with the ACRC. Um, I'm not sure to what extent journalists are actually seeking permission to go from the government of, or, of Nauru or to what extent they're simply assuming that they can't go or there are genuine issues around accommodation and flights, etc. So um, just perhaps a little comment on that because I'm not sure whether there, there's actually been a refusal or whether it's just you know, a lot of logistics because it seems to me that the government of Nauru is trying to introduce uh, an element of transparency that wasn't there the first time around. Um, uh, on the first thing, I would say that it, it is a little bit better than last time, actually, because um, my memory is that the only, um, I think SBS managed to get in as, on tourist visas uh, actually onto the island, and then, um, then the BBC went in undercover and did quite a strong report, and then that was just um, closed, even to the point when lawyers, I know Julian, uh, Julian Burnside tried to get in there as a lawyer and actually just could not, um, I think, get off, whether he actually I think, might have even got there and not been able to enter. So I think that that's right, it is a little bit better. I also think the journalists are a little bit more aware as well. Now, it's not right, they have been asking to get in. I definitely have spoken, yeah, definitely they, they're trying to get in and they've been told they can't. And um, I, I do know also that, um, that the Salvation Army workers in there don't feel threatened. There was some suggestion of violence. No one's worried about the, the violence aspect of it. So, yes, they are trying to get in. On, on the, um, and hopefully, there is a different government in Nauru. And whether, you know, they did sound very defensive this morning and uh, saying that, you know, they are trying to try and improve things. And on Manus Island, they said they couldn't imagine anyone staying there for five years. I mean, they're just pretending they don't actually know what the Australian government plan is. But on, on how to deal with the media, of course, I have been on both sides of the media myself and a target of the media. Um, as a journalist, you know, if I really want to get the... It depends if you're in what sort of approach you're taking, but as a source, I would always ask to be able to brief, brief someone really well as background, first of all, and give them the benefit of really giving them as much information as they can in a situation. Now, I'm not saying this is always the best form of journalism, but as a source, that's what I would ask for. Going into a broadcast interview, I hate to say it, but I've got a feeling that that idea of I know what I'm going to say in there, and um, I'm going to say it, whatever the questions are, it doesn't again lead to great journalism, but from a source's point of view, um, particularly if you're live, that can be the best thing. I think from the point of view of the United Nations, obviously a huge amount of really um, very important work goes on. And I think part of the problem is the United Nations has now been one, of, because it is one of the few critical sources, and that's why it was so critical in Sri Lanka what happened, that it tends to get positioned by the journalists as, we're going to try and, like, who can we get? Like, we actually think what's happening on Nauru is pretty bad. This I'm talking now like as if I'm a journalist, say. It, ABC, into SBS. Um, we think it's pretty bad, but the only way we're going to get a story on this is if we can get someone, somewhere, to say something critical. So we've got Amnesty, we've got United Nations, and just, and I think, yes, and because there's not, the other critical factor is there's just not a lot of space. Masses out there online, but actually the media aren't using that online space really well. Like, there's a few extra wire stories that have popped up on Fair, Fairfax. But actually, they're not out there doing extra stories. A little bit of extra video now. So, so I've also done a bit of a glimpse at the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age over a period of decades, and it's shrinking. The space is shrinking. So how many times the United Nations going to get um, quoted in the Sydney Morning Herald this week, at least from the Australian end of it? Maybe three or four, I don't know. You, you know. Yes, overseas a bit more, but that's all been fed in from elsewhere. So it, it's pretty tough. To get decent coverage. Possibly we'll have to finish. It's now time to go for a break. Uh, it will be a 20 minutes break and then please come back for the last session. But thank you very much to both Wendy and Kate. Something I neglected to say at the beginning was uh, thank you to the organisers for uh, bringing me from Melbourne and putting me up. And this opportunity for uh, citizen media to have its say, which we uh, don't always get. And if you want to know about our, the ethics of that question we asked earlier, 
Global Voices has a wiki for its authors, which is public, and you can go in and see all the kind of guidelines and things that the authors are expected to do. Uh, and it, it is